The Fitbit is a device that has been designed for the sole purpose of tracking health-related data. Fitbit's terms allow data to be stored indefinitely, and its short lifespan of five months showcase how E and D waste form an inextricably linked unit. The parallels between the waste stream during the life cycle of a unit Fitbit device can be summed up in three stages, mining and manufacturing, use, and afterlife. A pre-life. A technological disconnection. People today are surrounded by a multitude of gadgets that they have now become oblivious that these devices come from the earth. The soil. Asian soil. African soil. Technoprofits refer to these metals as the next oil of the 21st century, because without them, our devices are useless. Mining and manufacturing are two phases that form the pre-life of a device, where people are ignorant of the waste generated to provide them with their precious device. 4 grams of manganese in a Fitbit battery leads to 1 kilogram of physical waste. Mining for the entire Fitbit produces more than 25 kilograms. Assembling these metals to create the final product releases 8 kilograms of CO2. According to Josh Luparski, 75% of the waste produced in the life of a device is generated during the mining and production phase. Once the user accepts Fitbit's terms of use, the device will start its mission of permanently and ubiquitously collecting data. The 100 days on your wrist timer starts now. With its extensive array of sensors, a biometric wearable is nowadays able to draw a detailed picture of the health condition of its user. For measuring the rather simple metric of the heart rate, an army of sensors keeps track of every single second, thus hoarding an astronomical amount of data waste during the device's lifespan. On average, more than 300 megabytes of data are being generated during one year of usage, of which a large part will probably never enter the data supply chain. Once this raw data is collected by the Fitbit, a multitude of redundant copies are made ready to be sent to data centers all over the world. With this data now leaving the private sphere of the Fitbit, multiple actors start to harvest this data for the purpose of analyzing and advertising. They all add up not only to the proliferation of data but also to the subsequent accumulation of data waste. Therefore, during the device's time of usage, it's not only about every beat that counts, in fact, it's also literally every bit that counts. One hundred days later, the Fitbit is being disposed of. Due to the laborious nature of the dismantling work required, it's illegally shipped by sea. The Fitbit then finds itself in the biggest tea waste landfills around the world. Once it reaches the ground, the device, like many others, is dismantled manually and meticulously by a locally recycler. This is where the elements start transmuting if not recycled and illegally dumped on a site. Another byproduct with manganese amongst others is to become part of a viral infection network. A new form of a toxic disease starts spreading into an alien other. Stop. Every bit counts now taking its full meaning. Once the object is burned, the emitted byproduct becomes highly neurotoxic. The workers on sites are also exposed to dust via inhalation, ingestion, and dermal contact, containing harmful levels of toxic metals. As the dust finally reaches the ground, the toxic spill starts spreading to the nearby river directly connected to the Atlantic Sea. The dissolved micro compounds slowly sink into seawater eventually reaching the seabed, aggregating around a core nodule. Manganese nodules are considered to be the most important deposits of metals and other mineral resources in the sea today. The life cycle of a device forms an incomplete loop. 
Traditional recycling neglects the fact that 75% of the waste is being produced during the pre-life of a device. It turns the issue into a post-consumption discard dilemma. Thus the solution is not to literally close the loop. It requires a bypass. A bypass where traditional mining no longer plays a role in the infrastructure. What happens to the landscape of landfills where devices decompose and release toxic metals back into the soil? Post-closure, what would these landscapes look like? Are they graves or could they even be gardens? As a response to such findings, the proposed project is nor a garden nor a grave, but a place to be again. An afterlife facility for D plus E waste. A new form of a post-toxic productive and healing garden. We propose, a graceful, degradation system. Here, every bit truly counts, whether it be a bit of toxic manganese or a bite of redundant biometric data. Here, the unforeseen planetary byproducts are traced and foreseen. Here, waste is allowed to degrade gracefully. Here, on planetary crossroads, oscillating between land and sea, the systems arises at the conjunction between data centers, undersea cable landing sites, and onland toxic E landfills. Here, the conjunction allows for D plus E waste to symbiotically benefit from each other. Here, is Ankabog Bloshi, Ghana. The biggest and most polluted toxic landfill in the world. The Nungwa landing site, where undersea cables connect Ghana to the world wide web. The River Rodal. The body of water carries toxicity back into the ocean through the river delta. The physical manifestation of Sodom and Gomorrah as the others call it. Elongated along the river, the graceful degradation system aims to treat e-waste microaggregates and metal compounds as well as cold data and redundant data copies. The structure acts as a procedural system operating in three different stages over a time period of 10 years. Such procedures made visible through ceremonies of transformation and ritual pathways, meant for the bereaved humans to meditate then finally celebrate renewal. While part of the scenario speculates on multi-species collaboration to gracefully treat e-waste, the other side of the proposal consists of enacting data filtration and erasure. This way, guaranteeing the user a temporary grave to its cloud. Both parts will form an inextricably linked unit with their surrounding landscape, finally converting the site into a mutation of ephemeral infrastructural objects and post-anthropocene, organic elements. The structure is maintained and inhabited by new D plus E sacristans, ensuring that the filtration and ritualistic celebrations keep going. Putting D plus E waste substances at the core of the proposal requires a collection of about 20 machines and objects to operate simultaneously on site. Phase 1 Extraction Here, the contaminated landfill is being analyzed in order to extract the metals which decomposed into the soil as well as the leachate. On top of the site, 2.5 kilometers from the sea, a series of drones sit in the drone tower ready to analyze contamination levels of the soil using photogrammetry. To accomplish such a task, sprinklers are placed on the soil to disperse revealing fluids onto the soil. The sprinkler system is provided at regular intervals with fungi spore fluids produced on the sea structure. A transportation and conveying system connects land and sea elements for the extracted fluid to be exchanged seamlessly between both. The biomass together with the mushroom fluid are transported based on a connecting node system. Just like a straw would draw liquid from a glass, automated bioslurpers sink into the ground collecting the localized leachate, thus extracting highly volatile metals. Hyperaccumulator plants are grouped around specific basins on land, for each one of them to hyperspecifically digest the metals into their tissues. Such species, are able to naturally absorb metals from contaminated soil through their roots, concentrating extremely high levels of metals such as copper, zinc, or even silver. Once they have reached a certain level of concentration, the plants are then incinerated to retrieve the metal with the resulting biomass being transported back to the water infrastructure. For human workers and visitors, this marks the opening of the gate to wasteland, guiding you towards its floating structure. While during the first couple of years, 
The filtering procedures are mainly happening on land. The sea structure provides a range of ongoing specific interventions oriented towards the microtoxic components. Phase 2 – Filtering At this stage, a symbiosis between the two waste streams is created within specific units of the sea infrastructure. The treatment processing for data waste will benefit from e-waste as followed. Based on the African fractal, of the originally Ghanaian Awali game, three main platforms create a docking point. Farming, energy generation, data sanitization. Each one of them also work as a docking station for non-stationary units, moving according to the game set. As mentioned earlier, the first unit holds the mushroom farm. The mushrooms produce the fluids that are later harvested, rendering the soil toxic elements visible via a method named flow echo. The land biomass is used here as a way to produce energy for operating the treatment facilities. The floating pods are the most important elements of the structure due to their symbiotic nature. On the top layer, remaining liquid micro-metal particles are filtered with the help of bacteria, while on the underwater layer data is being filtered. The heat produced from the hot servers activate the bacteria to filter metal. Before performing each filtration procedure, they connect to the undersea data cables where data gets extracted. Redundant copies as well as cold data are being sorted out, ready to be erased permanently. Together with fungi and mushrooms, the deep plussy sacristans are to move along through the structure freely. Singing and praying once each pod sits back onto the main platform. Phase 3 – Grave Once the filtration is accomplished by the different pods, they first bring the data to be maintained into the different plant farms scattered across the structure. DNA storage plants are used to maintain such information. The pod's remaining D plus E content is in a second time converging towards the grave. Located 800 meters away from the shore and 20 meters underwater, the grave point is a place where data is erased by supercomputers. The grave is also the point where metals are deposited into dedicated silos. From the shore, the erasure procedure can be measured. It follows the motion of a 10 meters high pendulum, returning to degree zero each time the complete cycle is achieved. At the very end of the path, Facing the horizon, D plus E sacristans take turns to activate the overwriting grave process that is coordinated to the movements of the pendulum. Over time it opens up to more visitors, willing to mourn their D plus E loss. With this 10-year process, the landscape of Agbog Blushi has changed. Ready for a new life. A new beginning. These former machinic landscapes are replaced with a post-Anthropocene rainforest that gradually degrades while the soils and water bodies are rejuvenated. On the seashore, we sometimes hear the echo of a blessing that goes on, and on, to the rhythms of the structure dictated by ancestral games.